our collective obligation to walk together with First Nations peoples who have a lot to teach us about peace and non-violence and work together with them for treaty and truth and true national justice. So this land always was and always will be First Nations land. We're gathered here at 20 years on from a war that started from a series of lies. And we're gathered here, as we gather here, the most powerful forces in the media, the weapons industry and the political class are also gathering, but they're not gathering for peace. They're baying for war, and we must all be alarmed. Because 20 years ago, we went to war on a lie, and as Alison points out, we went to war without the parliament ever having a say. No democratic oversight, no asking of the Australian people, no permission being sought from parliament, and all based on a lie driven, delivered to us by our US overlords. And that followed a concerted campaign from the very same groups who are baying for war right now. That campaign has sent the US and its allies, including Australia, into what was a devastating and ultimately failed war with Iraq, from which the Middle East and much of the world has never recovered. And indeed, I'd say the United States has never recovered. And we're now at the 20th anniversary of that illegal invasion of Iraq, and we must learn from what happened. We owe that to the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis who've lost their lives as a direct result of the violence. The over one million Iraqis who are still displaced as refugees, and who have a government that still can't provide their basic material needs or basic security. All from a war of aggression that our government, on our behalf, took part in based on a lie, without ever asking us. So unless we learn from that history and demand accountability, then as the last week is so frighteningly proving, we are at serious risk of repeating it. Now as a Greens MP and a Senator, I'll be frank, I didn't come into politics to agree with Bob Carr and Paul Keating. That, is a, that wasn't my original plan. But hard politics makes unlikely allies. And the fact that we agree on calling out the recklessness of the AUKUS deal and the AUKUS submarines, the fact we agree proves just how broad the feeling in Australia is against this reckless deal. It proves it. We should be building a safe, peaceful future for Australia and our region. That should be our goal. And instead, the Albanese Labor government is seeking to permanently handcuff us to the United States military's aggressive war fighting plan. It's August is a handcuff for the Australian Treasury, for the Australian people, and for the Australian military. We're being taken to the next war, paid for by us, at the unquestioning direction of the United States. How can that be seen as anything other than a complete surrender of our sovereignty? And, and, and it is astounding that the Albanese government has officially adopted a hand-me-down coalition war plan. Like, they have become the coalition on this. And they have jettisoned decades of work from Labor grassroots members towards a more independent national stance. And they have jettisoned any pretense of a foreign policy based on peace and diplomacy. This is a national strategic surrender by federal Labor to the federal coalition. And it's to their eternal shame that they've done this. So, uh, unless this deal is reversed, Prime Minister Albanese will go down in history as the Prime Minister who drove us towards a war we never chose and no Australia wanted. At least he'll go down in history, provided after that war, there's someone around to actually write the history. Because that's the scale of the decision making we're facing. That's what defence experts are telling us. That after that this war, not by our choosing, taken there by the United States, that this war
may well escalate into a global catastrophe. We heard that from Colonel Lawrence earlier today, directly from the inside of the United States. So first, let's deal with the big lie behind this August deal. It is a minor claim that these nuclear submarines are about defending Australia. They are all about projecting lethal force into the South China Sea. And that's worth repeating, and repeating often. These submarines are not designed to defend Australia. They are designed specifically to threaten China. And is it any wonder China responds negatively to that? That's their purpose. And there is no question that that will inflame regional tensions and further drive a regional arms race. And, and twice this week, I was asked by senior journalists, including on the ABC, that given the Greens don't support the $368 billion AUKUS submarine deal, what would the Greens do to prevent China invading Australia? I was asked that by people who pretend to be credible on this space. But there's not one credible defence analyst, not one, who says that that is the risk being faced by Australia. Yet it's been peddled in the media and peddled in this debate and driven by those forces who want us to sign this deal regardless. War is not inevitable. This war is not inevitable. And the Greens join a growing chorus of former Prime Ministers, former Foreign Ministers, defence experts and millions of people from across the political spectrum who are pointing out the sheer recklessness of this deal. And the deal marks the official demotion of Australian diplomacy and the bypassing of Foreign Minister Penny Wong and Foreign Affairs for an international posture that's literally driven by the Australian Defence Forces and the global weapons manufacturers. And within our region, Indonesia, the Philippines and Malaysia have all expressed very real concerns. And we are getting with this deal at best, in 30 years, at best, eight submarines. And we are fundamentally damaging our international reputation, our sovereignty, and our relations with almost every neighbour in the region who don't want us to do this. How does that make us any safer? It doesn't. It makes us isolated with just one friend in the region. And, and we should ignore the United Kingdom. They have no strategic presence in the region. We lose friends with every regional neighbour. We lose decades and decades of building connections to get eight subs and a handcuffed commitment to the United States military. That is almost the definition of making us unsafe and surrendering our sovereignty. So we need an independent defence force designed to protect Australia, not to threaten our neighbours, but to protect Australia. And that does not involve a $368 plus billion dollar spending splurge that literally is designed to mesh us for decades to come in the United States military's war-making plans. Because it's a fact, we will not be able to crew, maintain, or deploy any of these nuclear submarines assets without the express prior permission of the United States. And we have the defense minister saying this is about our sovereignty. It would be laughable if it wasn't so utterly damaging to our national interests. We are literally becoming a self-funded subunit of the United States military. Now, the next big lie is actually the real cost of this project. The government, you may not have noticed, is now refusing to publicly back the $368 million figure. That was, I think as we look back over the last week, a plan, an interim figure, that was backgrounded to a handful of chosen media the night before the announcement to get us used to something like the real cost. Because like all of you, I went to bed one night last week thinking we had a $200 million nuclear submarine problem and I woke up finding it was a $368 million nuclear submarine problem. With no transparency, no public debate, no discussion. And now the government is publicly saying, well actually, that's not the cost, $368 million. It's $9 million in the next four years, 
another $58 million over the decade. And then the overall cost is now said to be 0.15% of GDP. Who has ever heard of a government program being costed as a percentage of GDP? That's not a budget. That's literally a blank check being handed to the ADF to spend as much of our money as they want. As much as they want, without a figure to even hold them to account. Again, if it wasn't, if it wasn't actually happening, this would seem like some sort of parody of strategic decision making and national defence uh, strategic planning. It would seem like a parody if it's what's actually happening down there in Cameron. Of course, that cost over the next 10 years doesn't include the billions and billions of dollars of additional costs to keep our existing submarine fleet in the water and upgrade the existing submarine fleet. They haven't told us that. And I think it's because they don't know. Yet billions and billions more will come from. And when asked about the true cost, we were told by the Treasurer and senior Navy figures that we can't afford not to do this. That's not an answer. That's a high school debating point on a program that is literally going to savage the rest of the federal budget. Because every dollar spent on August and nuclear submarines comes at an opportunity cost. It's a dollar we won't be able to spend on education. It's a dollar we won't be able to spend on urgent climate action. It's a dollar we can't spend on health or the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and the coalition's already coming for those programs. And for the defence forces, it's also a dollar that can't be spent on other potentially more flexible defence assets actually designed to protect Australia. It, it is a remarkable surrender of strategic government vision. And given the scale of the project, how is it we were told so little about it? How is it that even the small amount of information we're getting now only came out after the handshake happened to sign, the deal was signed? That's not democracy. That is not how democracy is meant to work. And indeed, even the United States has a far greater scrutiny of their defence spending than the Australian Parliament. The Australian Parliament will go against pretend scrutiny over defence expenditure. The bulk of the scrutiny, if you could call it that, happens in a closed club meeting of coalition and Labor MPs in a secret committee that is the pretend scrutiny of the Australian Defence Force budget and the Australian Defence Force strategic directions, and we never hear about it. Even myself as a senator are not permitted to see any of the information provided to that closed club. If this was the United States, there would be, there would be, you know, insurrection on the streets if that level of scrutiny, pretend scrutiny, was being provided to the US military. So let's be clear, war is not inevitable and we need to resist it more now than ever. And we need to build the peace movement and link together the millions of Australians who want a government that steps us back from war, not towards war. And we need to link with the unions and peace activists who have already been active in places like Port Kepler and the Illawarra and build this national movement. And today's meeting is a powerful start. As Nick said at the start of this meeting, let's use today as that launch pad for a national peace movement. And when we can say in five years' time, yes, I was at that meeting. I was there when we started the campaign that not only knocked off the August subs, but changed our national direction from war to peace. Because the New York Times ultimately apologised for its warmongering in the lead up to the Iraqi invasion. And 20 years on, we need an urgent reminder of that lesson. We don't want another apology. We need to stop another war. Thanks.